Hi folks, welcome back. This is a video on inverse trig and we are going to work out some example problems here. So we're gonna start with some problems that are pretty basic. Um, I have borrowed these from our textbook. It's first saying cosine inverse of square root of two over two. So what I'm gonna do when I try to solve this is I'm gonna turn this into an equation. I'm gonna say, all right, the cosine of what will equal root two over two? And I'm going to try to decide on my choices. So it helps if you've, it really, really helps if you memorize your unit circle. Um, at this point, this should be a really familiar ratio to you. Um, I noticed that it's positive root two over two. So my two answers will be in uh, candidate answers, I want to say, are going to be in quadrants one and two. Um, square root two over two is the ratio that happens when you have a 45, 45, 90 triangle or a pi over 4 angle. And for now, since I've turned this into an equation, I'm going to go ahead and list both possible answers, pi over 4 and negative pi over 4. So I'm going to say my possible answers pi over 4 and negative pi over four. I could also have given a uh, larger angle for the negative pi over four, like a seven, seven pi over four. Uh, but it's gonna turn out not to matter anyway, because uh, I was not actually solving the equation. I was being asked to compute the inverse cosine. And what I know about inverse cosine, because I watched the last video, place you should go if you haven't seen this, is that the range of inverse cosine is defined to be from zero to pi inclusive. Of these two answers then, even though there's two candidate answers, one of them is in the correct range and the other one is not, we're gonna reject that one. So I would write that the cosine inverse of square root 2 over 2 is exactly equal to pi over 4. And that's how we use those range restrictions to arrive at just the single answer, even though if you're drawing this out and creating triangles, you may give multiple answers, or you may want to give multiple answers. When we're talking about particular trig functions, there is only one answer, and it's dependent on the range restrictions we talked about before. Let's do another problem, sine inverse of zero. Okay, so I'm trying to solve the equation sine of huh equals zero. Oh, zero is a pretty weird number because I can't draw a triangle with sides of zero. So I have to remember that sine is like the y coordinate. And if I drawing this out on the just generalized unit circle, then I have one possible answer, theta equals zero, and sine is also equal to zero at the angle theta equals pi. So I have my two candidate answers. However, I'm not being asked to solve an equation. I'm being asked to compute an inverse cosine. The range uh, sine, the range on inverse sine is defined, see the last video again, from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And only one of these two answers is within that range. Pi is outside of that range, even though it's a perfectly valid answer to the equation or the question, where is sine 0? It's not a valid answer to our function because of our restricted range. And so I will write that the sine inverse of 0 is equal to just 0. That's the only answer to this question. All right, let's do a, one more kind of basic question. Um, tangent inverse of negative 1. So again, what I'm trying to do is solve, in a sense, uh, tangent of huh equals negative 1. 
Well, since tangent is opposite over adjacent, then I'm really looking for triangles where the opposite and adjacent sides are both one, uh, but one of them is negative. I can think of two triangles where that's true, a triangle in this quadrant, which would have theta as 3 pi over 4, and a triangle in this quadrant, which would have theta equals, I'm going to write it as negative pi over 4. So there's two candidate answers. I can't give two answers if I'm doing an inverse trig. I'm not trying to solve the equation. I'm trying to do the inverse trig problem. The range for tangent inverse was the same as the range for inverse sine. Quadrants 1 and 4. So I'm going to reject the answer that was in quadrant 2. And I'm going to select the answer that was in the correct quadrant, quadrant 4, and I will write that the tangent inverse of negative 1 is equal to negative pi over 4 only. By the way, it would be incorrect to write that the tangent inverse of negative 1 is equal to 7 pi over 4, even though it is true that another name for that angle is 7 pi over 4. Because of our range restriction, going from negative 90 to positive 90, or including those two quadrants in exactly that way, you would have to write that as negative pi over 4 and not as 7 pi over 4. 7 pi over 4 is also incorrect because it is not in the chosen range. Okay, we're now going to talk about a class of problems that I call kind of nested trig problems and the book we'll call composite trig problems and they're things that look like this cosine of sine inverse of one uh, half where you have an inverse trig and sometimes you have the inverse trig on the inside and that actually wouldn't make sense um, Sometimes you have the inverse trig on the outside, and you have a regular trig function in the other location. So those are kind of the two flavors that you have. Sometimes you have different functions. Sometimes you have the same function. And each of these three flavors, whether you have the different function, the same function, where the inverse is, actually has a slightly different solution, or has uh, not a different solution, but has some different nuances. So I'm going to try to break these up into each case do some casework, and talk about uh, what happens in each of those specific cases. So the first flavor of these functions is functions uh, where the inverse is inside the normal trig function, and the two functions are the same function. So this is one that if you see it, you might be tempted, and actually I think is a pretty good strategy, to just work from the inside to the outside. Cosine inverse of negative 1 is saying what's theta if cosine of theta is negative 1, well, let's see, cosine is the x-coordinate, so the only place the x-coordinate is negative 1 is at pi. So then this could really be thought of as cosine, and there's not even a problem with multiple choices here because it was negative 1. I don't even have to think about the quadrants. Um, pi is the only answer to this question. So then this is asking me, okay, what's cosine of pi? Well, what is cosine of pi? Oh, same picture. Negative 1. So we would write that this expression simplifies to negative 1, because you can work from the inside out. And you'll notice something has happened here. Um, because we had a function and we composed it with its inverse, we got x back. Remember how f of f inverse of x should always equal x. 
So we should always get negative 1 back for here. But I'm going to put a big asterisk by this idea because there are some trickinesses with the domain and range. And I think it's helpful, at least uh, when you can, to uh, do it step by step anyway. For the inverse inside case, this is actually always going to be true. And I'm going to do another example to help solidify that. Uh, so say I want to compute the tangent of the tangent inverse of 4.62. And I've chosen 4.62 because there's no way that you can just compute tan inverse of 4.62 without your calculator, but you can still solve this problem. Um, so it's just some any randomly chosen decimal. What's important to remember is that when you think about this as a whole, it's a function that takes as an input sides side lengths, ratios, and outputs, angles. So I don't actually know what the tangent inverse of 4.62 is, but I know that it's actually some angle theta, and all I know about theta is that the tangent of theta is 4.62. That's all I know about it. That's not a very useful fact, except in this one application because what am I being asked to do now? Well, I'm being asked to compute the tangent of that angle theta. You're like, well, I don't know how to compute the tangent of some random angle that I don't even know what it is. Yeah, sure. But you know one thing. You know that the tangent of that angle is 4.62. So you would write that the tangent of the tangent inverse of 4.62 is just equal to 4.62. And so the key here is really starting to think about expressions like I've boxed here in green, uh, tangent inverse or sine inverse or cosine inverse, as being just literal angles. Like you may not know what it is, but it's an angle. Uh, in, and we know even what quadrant sits in, it's in quadrant uh, four or one. And if you have an angle, you can take the tangent of it, or you can take the sine or the cosine of that angle. So if you have the inverse inside, that is, uh, situations like the cosine of cosine inverse of negative 1, or the tangent of the tangent inverse of 4.62, what you will always get as the output is the original input uh, argument to the, the very inside. That will always happen, and the reason that happens is, well, we talked about y in each of those specific problems, but this is a situation where you're just computing f of f inverse of x, and so you darn well better get x back out. Um, and also specifically, this happens here, and it, it behaves well in this case, because when I do write the, something like cosine inverse of negative 1 or tangent inverse of 4.62, those are defined as functions to be a single, specific, one single, specific theta. There's no ambiguity about what that angle is or where it lives on the quadrant plane. It's just a single, specific angle theta. And so when I uh, say what's the cosine of that angle, I get back the original side ratios. Here's the second case of uh, composed inverse trig. And this is a situation where you have still the same function, but you have the inverse function on the outside and not the inside. Uh, here, we're going to work from the inside to the outside, just like before. Um, and we'll start with sine inverse of sine of pi over 3 and see what we get. Well, so when you're working from the inside to the outside, sine of pi over 3 is just saying make yourself a little reference triangle. Drop your, your height because you're looking for the y-coordinate. And remember from your unit circle that this is going to be root 3 over 2. So you know what that is. You can calculate it. You can look at your unit circle sheet if you need to. And then this is asking me to compute the sine inverse of root 3 over 2. Okay, well, what's sine inverse of root 3 over 2? Well, that's some angle theta where sine theta is root 3 over 2. Now, I do have to check that my theta is in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4 because of the rule for sine inverse. I did not have to check that before uh, in the other problems because I was already given the angle theta. I, I didn't have to worry about it. Um, but here I'm kind of solving for that angle theta. Now in this case, uh, there 
is such an angle where the sine is root 3 over 2, I consult my unit circle. I say, aha, it's positive, so I'm in quadrant 1. What angle am I looking at? Well, theta must be pi over 3. So then uh, the answer to what's the sine inverse of root 3 over 2 is pi over 3. And if I go back to the original, then that means that the sine inverse of the sine of pi over 3 is equal to pi over 3. You would really, really expect that to happen. And it seems like we're in another case where you have uh, an f inverse of f of x, and you're getting back x. And that seems like that's always going to happen. But will it? Let's try another example. So I'm going to stick with sine. I'm going to stick with the pi over 3 angles. But let's do this problem. Sine inverse of the sine of 4 pi over 3. Okay. So, oh, where's 4 pi over 3? That's going to be in the third quadrant. The reference angle is still pi over 3, so when you drop this altitude, this is the longer side of a 30-60-90 triangle. Technically here, the sine of 4 pi over 3 is um, negative. We're looking at the negative y-coordinate. So, I'm now being asked to compute the sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2. The angle that I picked up when I computed the sine, or the, the ratio I picked up when I computed the sine of 4 pi over 3. But now watch what's going to happen. To solve sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2, I say, okay, sine of theta is negative root 3 over 2. Well, there's actually two places where that happens. One of them is 4 pi over 3, but the other of them is negative pi over 3. There's two candidate answers here for the sine inverse question, because I'm trying to sort of solve this mystery problem. And once I've done the inside, right, I've, you know, I'm, if I'm pretending I'm a calculator, I've forgotten that that inside was there. I don't know what the original angle thing was. All I'm trying to do is work from this uh, side length I've been given. So I actually have two possible candidate answers. And guess what? Sine inverse has a range from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 inclusive, which means that when I select one of these two answers to give, what am I going to pick? I'm going to pick the second one. And I'm going to get rid of or, or uh, reject the first one. So if I am blindly computing sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2, the answer you should give is negative pi over 3. Which means that if you're working from the inside out on this first expression, sine inverse of sine of 4 pi over 3, you should also give the answer negative pi over 3. And you'll notice that in this case, The inside angles did not match. So that's a challenge. What I would recommend is draw it out and work it step by step, at least for the first couple that you do. What you will start to notice, though, is that the reason this happened, why did this happen? It happened because 4 pi over 3 was outside of the range of sine inverse. So if you know that you're doing this, you see that sine inverse, you know what the range is, you see a quadrant three angle chilling in the inside um, of the expression, you should be suspecting that that quadrant three angle is not going to be the output that you give just because sine inverse can never output a quadrant three angle. It will always output a quadrant one or four angle. Um, so you can predict when problems like this will happen if you know the ranges of your inverse trig functions. And uh, 4 pi over 3 being outside of that range meant that we were going to have a problem. Let's do another one of those. So the 
cosine inverse of the cosine of negative pi over 4. And as soon as I see a cosine inverse on the outside, I want to think to myself, what's the range of cosine inverse? I know from the last video that the range is from 0 up to pi. And I also notice that this, negative pi over 4, is outside that range. So I expect that I'm going to have a problem. Let's work this out. So I, I know already that in this, this problem, the minute I wrote it, I haven't solved this one yet. I just wrote it. Um, I know that I'm going to have not negative pi over 4 is the answer. I can suspect that the answer I'm going to get, here's what I expect. Here's negative pi over 4. I'm going to expect that the answer that I will re report is the angle directly opposite that. 3 pi over 4, because that's in the correct range, and it's going to have the uh, same cosine. I'm actually wrong. The answer that I'm probably going to report is positive pi over 4, because it's in the correct range, and it has the same positive cosine value. So why don't I work this out just to double check myself, since I apparently I'm not sure of my own math here. So let's work the inside out. Cosine of negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 4 down in the fourth quadrant, is the x-coordinate, so I'm looking at something like 1, 1, root 2, that one's negative, so I'm looking for opposite over adjacent, so then this term is going to become uh, positive 1 over root 2, which you could of course rationalize to root 2 over 2 if you wanted to. I'm going to leave it unrationalized just because I can mostly. So now I'm doing the cosine inverse of 1 over root 2. Now I'm forgetting that previous problem was ever there. I'm now solving this problem. As I solve this problem, I'm going to draw myself a new axis. I'm going to say, oh, positive. Everything's positive. Well, cosine inverse is only exists in quadrants 1 and quadrant 2. And if everything's positive, I should be drawing my triangle in quadrant 1. Everything's positive. Let's do 1 root 2, 1 uh, adjacent. I should have drawn first. 1 root 2. Oh, what angle is that? That angle is positive pi over 4. So it actually turns out that, that when I go through the steps, I was right, or my uh, second intuition was right. Cosine inverse of cosine of negative pi over 4 is actually positive pi over 4. And hopefully my uh, little oopsies there help you understand why this stuff is so tricky and why it's important to really take your time and do your steps slowly and you know double check with your unit circle all the time. And if you didn't get a problem right, don't just ignore it. Go back and figure out why you got it wrong because there's a, probably a specific reason that that problem went wrong uh, to begin with. Okay. Another flavor of inverse trig problem. I know there's a lot. I promise there's, that we're nearing the end here. There's only three more, um, maybe two and a half more. Uh, another flavor here is problems where you are given different functions inside. And you can be given different functions um, inside with uh, known unit circle angles. Or in this case, you can be given different functions inside that have like side lengths of triangles. If you know the unit circle angle, like this is, uh, you know, one half or, or uh, sorry, one, and you can compute the tangent inverse of one, then just do like you would do before and work from the inside out. And what happens, actually, it's actually easier, is because you don't have matching functions, you're always going to get different angles. You're never going to have that weird inverse property going on. Uh, so you'll always be able to just work this if you work inside to the out. What the heck is going on with tan inverse of 7 over 24? I have never seen 7 over 24 on my unit circle diagram, so I don't know what to do with this. Well, remember that when I write tangent inverse of blah, 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 I'm writing that this is an angle theta. And the only thing I know about theta is that the tangent of theta 
is equal to 7 over 24. Well, guess what? That's enough information for me to draw theta. Uh, and actually, there's two pieces of information I have about theta. Uh, so I lied. Tangent theta is 7 24 I also know that theta is in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Why do I know that? Because of the rules on tangent inverse. So if I know what the tangent value is, and I know the quadrant that it lives in, I can draw a triangle. Here, all side lengths are positive. Uh, that's opposite over adjacent. So I'm going to draw my literal triangle. Now I could, of course, have had the same triangle in this quadrant with sides of negative 7 and negative 24 if I was just solving the equation. But because of the rule on inverse tangent, I know that that secondary triangle cannot be the proper triangle and that I should only be here in quadrant 1. So it is important to remember, even in this case, where those rules are. Um, 724, you can do the Pythagorean theorem, square root of 7 squared plus 24 squared. Uh, I happen to know that's a Pythagorean triple, so that's going to work out to 25 if you did do it. And the angle theta is right here. And now this function is just asking you to compute sine of theta, where theta is shown in the picture. So what's sine of theta? Opposite over adjacent. Uh, hypotenuse, opposite over hypotenuse. And so I would write, and you would write, that the sine of the tangent inverse of 7 24 is 7 25 And what work would you show? I would probably show that triangle as my work. Not so bad. Just be mindful of your quadrant, especially if you have something like a negative 7. Uh, that's usually when people mess up the quadrants. So as long as you are being mindful and you're drawing it in the correct quadrant for the function that you're using, and again, you've got to know those ranges so you know where to put your triangles, uh, you will be fine. Let's do something slightly different. Something with expressions. So say I wanted to compute the secant of the cosine inverse of 1 over x. Whoa there. So I have now this x value inside. Um, but the thing is, you're still just going to treat this as a side length. So when I look at cosine inverse of 1 over x, I know some things. I know that this is an angle. I know that the cosine of that angle is 1 over x, and I know that theta is in quadrant 1, or because it's cosine, defined as living in quadrant 2, quadrant 1 or quadrant 2. So let me sketch out this triangle. Now I don't actually know if x is plus or minus. There might be in some problems, uh, maybe in the directions, a, a statement. Um, but I'm going to assume that x is a positive number just for today. And I'm going to draw my triangle out. Now it doesn't matter if I draw this to scale. I'll draw a quadrant 1 triangle. Cosine is adjacent. Over hypotenuse. So the adjacent side is 1, the hypotenuse is x. Let's go ahead and solve for the remaining side. I'm going to need it for the next problem, uh, if not here. Even though that side is an x, guess what? We can do the Pythagorean theorem. 1 squared plus, I don't know, let's call this s for a second, s squared will equal x squared. So this side, s, had better be the square root of 1 minus x squared. So I'm able to find, if I know two sides, even if one of them has an x on it, I'm able to find that missing side. OK. So now I'm being asked to compute the secant Oh, so on the picture, here's the angle theta, right? So I said, here's what I know about theta. That lets me create this picture. 
Now I'm asked to compute the secant of theta. Secant is 1 over the cosine of theta. Well, so that's the reciprocal of cosine, so that's going to be uh, hypotenuse over adjacent, or in this case, x over 1. So the secant of the cosine inverse of 1 over x is just going to be x. These problems are usually just trying to get you to sketch this triangle out. They're probably not trying to trick you with like domain-y quadrant -y problems. I guess sometimes they might be. But mostly you are just going to be drawing that triangle and solving for the missing side. Now notice here I didn't use the missing side, but say that I had instead uh, asked the reader to compute sine of sine of cosine inverse of 1 over x. So cosine inverse of 1 over x is the same. So I'm going to refer to the same triangle up here. And now if I'm computing sine of theta, oh, sine of theta, that is opposite over hypotenuse x. And so I would write that the sine of cosine inverse of 1 over x is actually equal to square root of 1 minus x squared divided by x. Um, and what work would I show? I would just show that triangle again. So that's the last kind of flavor is where you have to solve for a missing side and then write an expression using it. Most of these will have the inverse trig inside. I think if you have the inverse trig outside, it, it makes less sense. All right, folks, so we've covered a lot today. Um, perhaps a quick recap. What did we look at of everything we looked at? We looked at some basic problems. How to compute uh, just cosine inverse, sine inverse, and tangent inverse when you are given uh, a ratio of side lengths. We looked at the how to use the range to give the correct answer when you have two possible answers and reject the wrong answers. Then we looked at nested or composite trig, and there were three different flavors of those. There was the kind where you had the same trig function and the inverse was on the inside. In those situations, the trig function on the outside cancels with the inverse, and you just get the uh, x value initially back. We talked about why that was true. We looked at some situations you can happen where the inverse is on the outside, and what happens there is as long as the uh, argument of the statement is within the correct uh, range of sine inverse, you're going to get the same argument back like we did in the first example. However, if that initial argument is outside of the range, it's in the wrong quadrant, it's a quadrant three angle or a quadrant uh, two or four angle for the for certain functions, you're going to, it's gonna change the output. Just when you see those, work from the inside to the outside, carefully remembering your rules and don't get lazy. If you have different functions composed, usually the best thing to do is make a triangle and solve with the Pythagorean theorem. And that's true whether you have specific side lengths like 7 and 24, or if you have expressions that relate to x, uh, even if you have those expressions that relate to x. And that's all that we've got for you today. Thank you for watching. I'm going to cut one more video on inverse trig for you guys to watch. I hope you're spacing these out. Don't watch all these videos in one. Uh, but the net last video is going to talk about the graphs of the three inverse trig functions. I'm going to use some Desmos uh, on my other computer to show off what those graphs look like. And that is the plan. So as always, email me with your questions, post uh, links to classroom, and uh, I hope you're all doing well. I will see you guys next time.